Good afternoon and welcome to the 102nd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we have a discussion of COVID-19 in Haiti and the Caribbean with Francisca Lucien and Mimi Scheller. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime, recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, August 11th, 2020, there are 20,130,206 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 19,919,559 reported yesterday. Of those, 5,100,636 are in the United States, up from 5,058,564. There are now a total of 164,329 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19. That's up from 163,100 yesterday, still at the pace of more than 1,000 deaths a day. In Haiti, there have been 7,634 cases with 183 deaths. Puerto Rico, uh, as a subset of the American total, reports 22,821 cases with 279 deaths. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for COVID-19 sufferers every day. I'd like to continue that now with a note of hope from a New Yorker article, this was published April 13 by Edward Stanticat, and the title is The Ripple Effects of the Coronavirus on Immigrant Communities. And this will tie in with our discussion today. I suspected that things might be getting serious when at a memorial for an elderly friend who died long before COVID-19 was a pandemic, many of us tried to figure out how to greet one another. The scenario might have amused our friend who died of natural causes in the arms of his wife at the age of 93. His memorial was one of the last gatherings on the main campus of Florida International University, which soon afterward moved to online learning. The remarks on our friend's life and work were preceded by a public service announcement reminding the 60 or so of us to wash our hands frequently, cough into our elbows, and avoid close physical contact. It will be hard not to touch, we said to one another, we're Haitians. In saying so, we were perhaps echoing what so many other groups around the world had said on similar occasions. We did what we could with elbow bumps, but there were occasional lapses into tearful hugs and kisses until someone jokingly suggested a butt bump, which a few of us tried with mutual consent. Saying that we're Haitians might also have been an acknowledgement of our past collisions with microbes. In the early 1980s, the Centers for Disease Control named four groups at high risk for acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, intravenous drug users, homosexuals, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. Haitians were the only ones solely identified by nationality, in part because of a number of Haitian patients at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami. In October of 2010, nine months after a magnitude seven earthquake struck Port-au-Prince and the surrounding areas, Nepalese UN peacekeepers stationed in the north of Haiti released raw sewage from their base into one of Haiti's most used rivers, causing a cholera epidemic that killed 10,000 people and infected close to a million. As of this writing, and again, this is an article from April of 2020, Haiti has had only 15 cases they did at that time of COVID-19, but fearing that the disease could ravage the country and its fragile health infrastructure, Haiti's president declared a state of emergency, imposed curfews and closed schools and airports. When I first moved to Miami's little Haiti neighborhood in 2002, I would often hear my neighbors say, whenever Haiti sneezes, Miami catches a cold. That is, whatever was happening in Haiti could have ripple effects in Miami homes, workplaces, schools, barbershops, and churches. The reverse is also true. Already, hundreds of Miami Haitians, like many other Caribbean and Latin American immigrants who work in the tourism 
hospitality and service industries here have lost their jobs owing to COVID-19. Not only will they have trouble providing for themselves, they will also be unable to send money back home to those who count on them to survive. And Miami is home to a large number of Haitian American medical personnel who could become ill as the pandemic spreads. The ripple effect of lost wages and even worse lost lives in immigrant communities will gravely affect the economies of our neighboring countries. According to Marlene Bastien, the executive director of Family Action Network Movement, a community organization that works with low-income families. Bastien and her staff were forced to temporarily close their offices, but their mostly elderly clients kept showing up to ask for help. She has been trying to work out a system for her centers, case managers, mental health professionals, and paralegals to provide services by phone or on WhatsApp. Poor immigrant communities already have a great deal of need, she says. This crisis will only multiply the need. I remember telling a friend at the memorial service how I was planning to be in Chile this week with my family to launch the Spanish edition of one of my books and to visit some members of the Haitian community there. My oldest daughter would be turning 15 while we were in Santiago and because her birthday often falls during spring break, she's come to see these purposely timed work trips as special excursions for her. This week while we were observing Miami's stay at home order, I asked my daughter what she wanted to do for her birthday and she said that just as we had done a few times before, she wanted to drive someplace pretty to see a beautiful sunset. Maybe next year we will be able to do that. You can find the full piece in the New Yorker magazine, April 13th. Headline was The Ripple Effects of the Coronavirus on Immigrant Communities by Edwidge Anticat. Okay, I'd like to turn to our conversation today. Let me introduce my guests. Francisca Lucien joined the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti as executive director in July of 2019. She is a committed advocate for social justice and an experienced international development professional, skilled in strategic management, fundraising, communications, and advocacy. Her work focuses on the intersection of equity, health, and a rights-based approach to development. She served as Deputy Director of Policy and Partnership for Partners in Health in Liberia, coordinating with underserved communities, non-governmental organizations, the Ministry of Health, and international organizations to improve delivery of critical health services in the wake of Liberia's Ebola epidemic. She worked extensively in Haiti, leading key projects to strengthen public delivery systems for health care and implementing the human right to health for rural, marginalized communities. She holds an MA from the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs and a Bachelor of Science from the Georgetown University Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service, and she is multilingual. Welcome to COVID Calls, Francisca. Let me also introduce my second guest, Mimi Scheller. Mimi is a colleague of mine. I'm proud to say she's professor of sociology and the founding director of the Center for, Mo for Mobility's Research and Policy at Drexel University in Philadelphia. She is the founding and co-editor of the journal Mobilities. She is associate editor of the journal Transfers and past president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic, and Mobility. Among her many books, Island Futures, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene, which is due out this year with Duke Press, also Mobility Justice, The Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes, Aluminum Dreams, which was out with MIT Press in 2014, Citizenship from Below, Consuming the Caribbean and Democracy After Slavery, Black Publics and Peasant Radicalism in Haiti and Jamaica. Francisca and Mimi, thank you for your time today and welcome to COVID Calls. Hi, Scott. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. It's great to join you and Mimi today. So I'd like to start the way I always do, just finding out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation there is right now. And so Francisca, may I start with you, please? Absolutely. So I'm calling in today from the US just outside of New York City, um, where the COVID situation continues to improve um, mm -hmm. after a pretty challenging series of months earlier on in the pandemic. And All right, thank you. Mimi, same question to you. Yeah. And I'm calling in from Midcoast, Maine in the US. 
And this is a state that has one of the lowest uh, rates of infection in the country. And partly that's because of its remote rural character. Um, but I, I wanted to just mention that the few cases that have been brought into Maine have been traced, their origins are either tourists coming from outside, which is a problem the Caribbean faces, or migrant agricultural workers who have been working their way up through the US and have been exposed um, along the way and live in fairly tight conditions. And some of those migrant workers are from Jamaica and Haiti. Um, and I also always think about this coastal part of Maine is actually very much connected to what used to be called, um, you know, the British West Indies. And there was extensive trade between these regions. And so the whole landscape, the history of this part of New England is based on trade with the Caribbean. I'd, such an important connection to make even early on that we don't think of the trajectory of Caribbean history or Haitian history as somehow vastly remote from the United States and, and other North American histories. And I'm sure we're going to mm -hmm. get to that as we have our discussion. Um, very impressive, as always, to read the uh, professional bios of guests on COVID calls. I, I wanted to just follow up a little bit and maybe Francisca start with you and just ask you a little bit more about your connection and your research in Haiti. Um, how did you get drawn into your work there, your advocacy work there? Can you tell us a little bit more about your connection there? Yeah, absolutely. So my current connection to Haiti is through my work with the Institute for Justice and Democracy um, in Haiti. As you mentioned, the um, as, in, as you mentioned, I joined IJDH about a year ago. Um, and our work is really um, in partnership, is a partnership between Haitian and U.S. human rights advocates. We partner with a local uh, law firm that's based in Haiti that works on issues of constitutional and human rights law. And together, we really take on advocacy and litigation um, that centers communities that are most marginalized within Haiti to really uh, advance the legal protection of their rights through um, systems of rule of law within Haiti. Um, this is, uh, you know, really building on my own involvement in Haiti um, beginning in 2011. Um, so about a year and a half after the earthquake where I was based in Haiti from 2011 to 2016, um, really working on uh, issues of reconstruction and supporting the um, kind of revitalization of the health sector post earthquake. Um, and so, you know, that work has really been informed by my own um, research and interest in the history of Haiti. Um, it really uh, has played a role as a beacon within the international system as, you know, the first country to effectively abolish slavery, the first black independent nation, um, but also has, uh, you know, had a very challenging trajectory within the international system, beginning with the independence tax that was levied against the country um, and where we continue to see the effects of that on um, Haiti's own development, um, institutional capacity, and really ability to confer essential and basic rights to its population. So um, I'm really glad to be on the call with you both today to kind of speak to some many of these issues. Mimi, let me ask you that same question. I mean, I know you published your first book about the region in 2000, so you have a, you have a longstanding uh, set of research connections there. Can you say a little bit more about how you were first drawn to the history of Haiti? Yeah, so I've been studying um, Haiti and the wider Caribbean region since the 1990s. And like Francisca, I completely agree. I was inspired by the Haitian Revolution, by the politics um, around freedom and emancipation. And, uh, the, and I was studying at the time the history of democratization movements and so often they left out the Caribbean. You know, they focused on the American Revolution, the French Revolution, British Parliament. And so I got really engaged in sort of studying the history of democracy from the seat of where I think the driving force of it came, which was from emancipated people um, and their, their struggle to gain their rights. Um, and so I first went to um, 
Jamaica in 1995 for dissertation research. And I lived in Kingston um, doing kind of archival research. And I visited Haiti for the first time in 1997 with the Haiti Support Group, which is a London-based kind of advocacy organization. And they organized uh, meetings with a whole lot of grassroots organizations. And I was really inspired by the kinds of political movements in Haiti and the peasant movements, which were very strong and which were what I was studying in the 19th century. So it was fascinating for me to see what was happening with them in the late 20th century. Um, and more recently in the last decade, I was able to return to Haiti um, partly uh, as a researcher with um, research projects with some uh, colleagues at Drexel uh, who are engineers and we returned in 2010 after the earthquake um, and did a project in Leogan on water and sanitation, um, rebuilding and planning and community involvement in planning after the earthquake. And then I was back again in 2013 and 2014 with a project that was actually on climate change related flooding of two lakes, um, one in Haiti, one in the Dominican Republic. Um, I've also been back again with the, the Caribbean Studies Association, held one of their annual meetings in Port-au-Prince, which was nice. Um, so my kind of recent work has been reflecting on this kind of this past decade of um, my engagement with Haiti and issues around the earthquake and also hurricanes um, and broader kind of recovery uh, from disaster efforts. Mm -hmm. So you both have these long-standing interests and, and connections with, with the region. And I, I want to bring the, the timeline up to 2010, since you both mentioned the earthquake. Um, let's talk about that a little bit, because I think that, you know, getting this context of where we find ourselves today, of course, it has a much deeper history, but that 2010 earthquake is super relevant. Francisca, can you talk a little bit about how you see that now, how you see the impacts of that earthquake, how it affects the work you do now, mm -hmm. lessons that were taken away from 2010 that actually resulted in positive changes on the island or maybe even other places in the world? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Scott. Um, I would say that you know, from my perspective, the the 2010 um, earthquake really was a defining moment in Haiti's history um, that I would say laid bare very significant issues of structural injustices that actually made the earthquake so damaging to begin with. Um, I, I do think that there are really important lessons that can be taken from, you know, the, the reconstruction process um, and how to really uh, look at and address you know, certainly acute crises, um, but, you know, with an understanding and uh, analysis of the more structural drivers um, that impact, uh, that affect the impact of, of that kind of acute moment in time. And so what I mean by that is, you know, really uh, during my time in Haiti over those five years working on reconstruction, you know, the, the core lesson was to try to look at what were some of these systemic gaps that were in fact laid bare um, and what steps could be taken to address those and really support a country led solution um, that that could, um, you know, improve and strengthen areas where there were capacity gaps. Um, I, I think Haiti benefited significantly from a very real international um, outpouring of support to the country. But I, I think 10 years on, we are faced with very real lessons um, that also came out of that reconstruction process. So there were some that were positive, um, but there are some that you know, have underscored the importance of taking this rights-based approach, a rights-based approach that looks at principles of accountability, that looks at principles of prioritizing local groups and participation of international, you know, self-determination, uh, international respect of self-determination um, of country stakeholders and country-led solutions, um, and then really upholding the principles that underpin rule of law. Um, so ensuring this kind of stable footing that can then allow in institution institutions to flourish um, and be in a position to um, either kind of provide an effective reconstruction or better yet, offer an even more stable platform so that 
these sort of disasters don't have such a devastating impact um, on the populations. And what we see is that 10 years on, many of the factors, many of these, you know, what I refer to as structural injustices continue to disadvantage, you know, Haiti's development and opportunities for inclusive growth. And, and I think to put those in concrete terms, one of the very real challenges um, or one of the very real factors is this prioritization that has happened in Haiti of short term solutions over uh, uh, sorry of short term responses over long term solutions and and the weakening of state capacity and the weakening of governance systems is something that we we have to kind of reckon with um, at this current moment and think about how do we uh, learn from that and take a, a, a better approach, um, particularly as we're now facing another crisis with COVID. Can I just follow up, Francisca, with, for one second with you on that? Can you give us an example maybe of, of how that, that dynamic works as you see it, where uh, a longer term issue that may impinge on structural inequalities it maybe it's acknowledged, but said, you know, but in the aftermath of disaster, we can't possibly get to that. We have to deal with the short, short term, because I think this kind of temporal ordering of priorities mm -hmm. is, is a kind of a, a common thing, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about it from the Haitian perspective. Can you add a little more detail on that? Sure. I, I think, um, the one example that I would cite in terms of a challenge, but I'm also happy to, to highlight examples where I think it has been more successful. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges that we did see during the earthquake reconstruction um, was this outpouring of support, but it, it, you know, only 4% of committed funds um, uh, went directly to uh, direct budgetary support to the government. Um, and less than two, you know, less than 2.5% to local organizations and companies. And so what that means is that you have this really important set of stakeholders at the country level that were effectively sidelined because they didn't have the resources to be able to effectively steward and oversee the implementation of, of priorities. Um, on the other side, because it, you know, I, I think it is important to highlight where there are successes, I, I think there um, you know, the, the data has shown that probably the um, sector that had the stronger successes of reconstruction was the health sector. And that was largely because the Ministry of Health was at the table together with stakeholders um, and was really driving the priorities, indicating that they wanted to see the rebuilding of the health workforce, that they wanted to extend um, critical health services outside of the capital and then bringing on board partners that could support them to actually implement that work. Thank you for that. Mimi, I want to turn to you on that. And I know some of the work you did immediately after the earthquake, because you published some of it in, in the journal Engineering Studies, one of the many studies that you, you did, in which you did a collaboration with engineers. I want to pick up where Francisco was there, a little bit about some of the lessons learned through that hurricane and I'm yeah, also absolutely. excuse me through that earth through that earthquake. Yeah. Um, I'm, I mean, I completely agree with Francesca that resources were not directed um, to local organizations, and there are many, many or what I call community-based organizations throughout Haiti, and they really were excluded in a way. And a lot of the post-earthquake planning processes were not conducted in Creole which is the language that most people in Haiti speak. Um, they were either done in French or in English, and they didn't connect with the leadership of those local grassroots organizations. And so you had a lot of different outside groups coming in and running around doing things, sometimes at cross purposes and often without um, mm. understanding the very specific uh, cultural context and the sort of power structures, the local power holders and the different groups and how people related to each other, how people got things done in what was a difficult situation. And so there, I think there were just a lot of lessons to be learned about the need for any kinds of first responders as well as researchers, engineers, NGOs to gain cultural competency to speak the language, to know something of the history, and above all, to understand our role, those of us in the global north, 
in causing some of the problems that the mm. whole post earthquake re recovery process was kind of mired in. Partly those problems were our fault. And I, I think it's really important to take these kind of sudden disaster events and like Francesca said at the beginning, look at uh, them in somewhat of a longer term perspective of, for me, the history of colonialism, imperialism, racial capitalism, neoliberal extractive economies, the structural kind of foundations of the current context. That is what is behind what makes this um, what I call an unnatural disaster and others call, have called an unnatural mm -hmm. disaster. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not just the earthquake itself, it's everything that goes into that history of power relations. Mm -hmm. That's a, such a powerful concept. Uh, and I know that it's, it's one that there's a podcast that I like called Disasters Deconstructed uh, that also talks about, it sort of pushes back on the concept of a natural disaster. You call it an unnatural disaster, which means you have to be looking for these factors that allow something we often will call natural to occur in the first place. Mimi, I want to stay with you just for a second because um, the method that you outlined there, um, which is one that involves, um, if you are going to come from outside of Haiti and offer aid as part of a team, um, developing cultural competency, understanding the history, um, making sure you can speak the language and not expect everyone just to accommodate English. Um, that, to me, it all sounds appropriate. At the same time, I know you've also worked with teams of engineers. How does this, it's, it sounds like the right methodology, and yet when I think about you deploying it, I'm trying to imagine these conversations. How does it really work on the ground? So, well, I mean, one thing that was important that we had um, was, first of all, embedding me as a social scientist who had studied Haitian history and culture in an engineering team, that, that was helpful. And actually after the event, there was um, the National Science Foundation held a big workshop reviewing all of their rapid grants. And one of the recommendations was that social scientists and anthropologists and sort of people who have cultural um, knowledge should be embedded in engineering and um, other kinds of like first response teams. But the other side is that we also had translators. I mean, you do need translators and not everybody is going to speak the language to the same degree. And our translators were people who were Haitians from the Haitian American diaspora. And that has its own issues um, of how the diaspora is, you know, perceived by Haitians at home, but it's still helpful to have Haitian diaspora translators, participants in the research, not just language translators, but kind of cultural competency translators. Mm -hmm. um, so to really work as a team. And then in conducting surveys that we did, we actually trained a group of Haitian university students. And it's so important um, in terms of building up um, competency for research and for different kinds of academic work to partner with Haitian institutions, universities, um, and anywhere you're working in the Caribbean to work with the students there, to work with the faculty there, to help the institutions get funding so that it's not all just being sucked out to the United States. I want to remind everyone that you're listening to COVID calls and we're talking about COVID-19 and Haiti and the Caribbean today with Mimi Scheller and Francisca Lucien. Francisca, I want to um, come back to you and, and see if we can't connect a bit now the situation from 2010 and the earthquake aftermath to the present. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more. You said that one of the after effects was some strengthening of the health system, some attention to it. Um, can you lay out the context a little bit coming into this year of pandemic? What were still some of the structural inequalities in Haiti? What were some of the big challenges the health system might have been facing before the pandemic started? Absolutely. Um, and and I think that's right. While there were while there was some progress um, with the health sector in the aftermath of the earthquake, um, it still faces very significant challenges. And, and going into the COVID pandemic, you know, early estimates had, you know, approximately 60 to 70 um, intensive care beds available with ventilation support. 
um, within the country for a total population of 11 million. So Haiti was facing a very steep, steep challenge um, at the start of the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and it wasn't limited to the health sector. Um, prior to the start of the pandemic, you know, Haiti had uh, Haiti has been in a very uh, challenging um, socioeconomic um, and political context uh, that really stemmed from um, a call for accountability for the reported, you know, 1.7 billion in misappropriation of Petro Caribe funds um, that that spurred essentially. Uh, uh, what resulted in a gridlock by the end of 2019. Um, and so some important uh, figures to keep in mind in terms of the socioeconomic backdrop um, was, you know, as, as is often reported, Haiti has, you know, approximately two thirds of the population um, that live below the, the national poverty line. You know, one in 12 uh, children aren't expected to reach the age of five. Um, during this kind of crisis moment, um, in Haiti, food security doubled um, within a year. And by the end of 2019, it was estimated that 4 million would face a food crisis going into 2020. Um, the national currency depreciated by over 40% and inflation was in double digits. Um, I, I think it's important to also keep in mind that um, Haiti is a large, has a very large informal sector economy. Um, and so remittances, so, you know, from the Haitian diaspora um, to family members and friends within Haiti, those, that money that's transferred accounts for approximately um, a third of the nation's gross domestic product, according to a 2017 mm -hmm. study that was done. Um, and as Haiti kind of is, is, was going into the COVID pandemic, the World Bank projected that those remittances would likely decrease by 20%. So that's a huge source of income. Um, for for people within Haiti, particularly those within the informal sector. Um, and so what we see as major challenges is that um, the population was already facing a very dire economic situation within the country. Um, and the kind of standard measures that were, um, you know, implemented across a number of countries for COVID, so stay at home orders, recommendations for hand washing and ensuring good sanitation um, within the households and, and in office areas, um, you know, social distancing, those things were really actually privileges and luxuries that most in Haiti and in, in or most within the informal sector in Haiti really couldn't afford. Um, and so the, 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 that socioeconomic backdrop has very real, has had very real implications. Um, for communities, um, certainly within the urban settings, but also rural communities and their ability to, to um, really uh, take on measures to mitigate the risk of disease spread and, and protect their health and, and the health of their, their family and communities. Keep bearing all of those many challenges in mind, and I wasn't aware of that remittances number. I hadn't thought of that context until you just said that. What a really profoundly important, again, sort of connecting point. If a third of the GDP is coming from workers in a, in a diaspora, it doesn't just matter what happens with public health in Haiti. It happens what matters with public health in Florida. Um, that's an important point. Mimi, I know you've been keeping a close eye on the way that the Haitian government um, and the governments in the Caribbean more broadly um, have been reacting to the pandemic and um, you mentioned to me the uh, Caribbean Public Health Agency, which I actually don't know much about. Could you say a, a little bit about how you see the situation having unfolded in the last couple of months from your from your perspective? Sure. So um, the Caribbean Public Health Agency is a single regional public health agency for the Caribbean that was established in 2011. And um, all of the Caribbean community mm. member states um, joined it in 2013. And it's meant to sort of help create an umbrella of public health policy that spans, you know, from Guyana, Suriname, and Trinidad in the south, all the way up to the Bahamas, Bermuda, even in Belize. Um, it, it excludes only the, the French territories and the U.S. territories and Cuba. Um, so it's a it's a comprehensive 
health agency that also deals with emergencies. Um, so it's kind of um, combines, you know, public health response and emergency management and things like that. So what happened in the Caribbean region is they they saw um, kind of what was unfolding in the United States and as well as in the UK, who would have been the partners for some countries normally facing a disaster situation of some kind. Um, and they realized they were they were not going to get the help they wanted and needed from those traditional sources. And in fact, the U.S. blocked certain kinds of um, personal protective equipment and ventilators from being shipped to the Caribbean um, and kind of seized those shipments that were on the way there. So they realized they had to fall back on their you know own resources and their own public health agency, and they did it really well. And I think it's really important to emphasize that. The Caribbean community did an excellent job of stopping the virus from entering their countries. And so what we see is that overall, um, I think the region has 13,473 COVID cases and 288 deaths. And about half of those um, are attributable to Haiti, right? Haiti has 7,649 cases and 183 deaths. Um, so what you saw is many governments kind of leapt into action to stop flights from coming in, to stop um, their ports, and to stop entry at their ports, and to um, set, set up a system of um, quarantine. And, and what's happened is it was very successful in the initial months but then the economic pressures were to open up again. And so they started opening up in June and July and allowing tourism to return. And that's where the new sort of rise of cases came from. Um, but even with that, the current policies are very um, smart, I think, um, and they involve requiring arriving passengers to get a test uh, within the past 72 hours before arriving. And if they haven't had one, then they have to get an immediate test on the spot and they have to quarantine until that test result comes back. And they're also requesting the, the countries with the strictest regulations, and it varies by country, they're, they're requiring a 14 day quarantine for anyone with symptoms. They're requiring um, an address and contact tracing um, capability and in some cases, a mobile app is being used. For example, in Belize, there's a mobile app that visitors have to use so that they can do the contact tracing and keep track of where people are. So they've really been able to sort of cap what could have been an explosive rise in cases. In Haiti, one of the big issues that let the virus spread um, is partly that political situation, right? And the, and the sort of breakdown of governance where they're in a crisis right now where there's parts of Port-au-Prince that are being controlled by gangs and there's actual, you know, fights, uh, gunfire between police and gangs and things like that happening. But the big issue was one, returning uh, migrants, Haitian migrants and Haitian Dominicans who have been unable to stay in the Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic had mm -hmm. an earlier outbreak and so sort of Haitians returning to Haiti kind of brought that back into the country. But the other is the repatriation of Haitians and the deportation of Haitians from the United States. And that's a topic I also wanted to speak to. I don't know if you want me to pause there for a moment before I get to that. Let's, I'm learning so much in this conversation. Thank you for that. I, wanna, I just wanna follow up on, on one thing. You're talking about this um, Caribbean Public Health Agency. It strikes me this is gonna be one of the real things that we're going to learn from and study a lot as we move through COVID-19 is the way, I mean, I'm thinking immediately in the United States in the absence of federal plan of any merit that groups of states, so this is subnational rather than international, but still groupings of states in the Northwest and Pacific West and in the, in the uh, Great Lakes states in the Northeast actually did something kind of similar to come up with some sort of corresponding procedures and policies to share information and to try to, um, it doesn't sound like it actually worked as well as what you've described in the in the Caribbean there, meaning it's, it's really interesting. I, I just want to ask a, 
a sort of follow up to that, Francisca, to you, as I know, um, you know, you talked about your emphasis on this sort of human rights led approach to development and to disaster relief. Um, even in the absence of a high number of deaths, there must be still significant violence that goes on in the context of a pandemic. I mean, governments often use these kinds of disaster contexts to enact policies that can be harmful against one group another. We're seeing this play out in the United States, and I think we'll come back to this issue that Mimi was talking about in a minute. But I wondered if you wanted to speak to any of the sort of human rights challenges that are playing out in Haiti right now. They may not be people getting sick and dying of COVID, but maybe somehow violence or inequality that's propagated because of that fear or that concern. Yeah, so I would say that the human rights challenges um, that Haiti is facing right now kind of link back to what I mentioned, or I made passing reference to in terms of the political situation. Um, and so for about the last two years, there has been a, a very steady call um, that's emerged from civil society within Haiti, um, calling for accountability and end to corruption in the wake of reports that documented approximately 1.7 billion um, in misappropriation of, of Petro Caribe funds. Um, and the reason why I reference that is because it's really the trajectory of that movement over the last two years um, and a political response that has included violence and repression against protesters that you know, was very well documented by a number of human rights groups, both within Haiti and outside, including Amnesty International at the end of 2019, that has really created a legitimacy crisis in Haiti. Um, and the, the direct impact that I would you know, say that it's had in, in terms of the COVID pandemic um, is actually a lot of um, early disbelief um, within, the, within communities about COVID and this um, you know, kind of uh, rumors that were propagating that this um, you know, COVID wasn't real, that this was something that was created because there, there, was, there has been such a lack of confidence um, in the current uh, government and in, in the local systems of governance within Haiti. And so the, this legitimacy crisis it, it has played out um, in COVID and in terms of how people uh, receive the uh, you know, decree that was issued by the president in terms of uh, uh, measures to be taken in response to the pandemic, the way that the virus um, was perceived by the population, particularly in its early days, um, and the very real challenges on the socioeconomic side that are, are inextricably linked um, to the, the political situation within the country. I would say, however, because I think it is really important in Haiti's case to note this, um, while there are, are very real human, right challenge, human rights challenges that Haiti is facing, um, the expectation was that Haiti was you know, likely to see 20,000 cases of COVID. Um, and while there has been you know, very real issues with access and availability of testing, um, the, you know, it's approximately 7,500 confirmed cases and the expectations of the impact that COVID was going to have on Haiti um, have fortunately not played out to the uh, full extent anticipated. And I would say that there are some, um, you know, important lessons behind that. I think that many of those come from um, Haiti's experience in responding to the cholera outbreak that was introduced um, in 2010. And, and those really boil down to, um, the, again, this approach that centers communities, that focuses on making testing accessible to communities where they are, um, tracing contacts. So, you know, as people are uh, being tested positive, going out and identifying the contacts, bring them into the health facilities, get them tested as well provide treatment um, and treatment that is available through health facilities that are appropriately staffed, that are appropriately resourced, and then also the support that is needed for those who may have to be in situations of quarantine or because they're infected with COVID may not be able to go out um, and, and work. And if they're the primary breadwinners of their household, that's a very real economic impact that it has on other members within that household. And, and what you see in Haiti's response right now is many of those same leaders 
that kind of took the charge in responding on cholera, they are at the head of this response in COVID as well. And so I, I think mm -hmm. there are important lessons that Haiti can offer to other countries um, and how it's learned from its own experiences, um, but also the fact that contact tracing, for example, which is a tried and true public health approach has really been implemented in Haiti for over three decades. I mean, Haiti has a significant amount of experience in contact tracing going back to the 1980s with tuberculosis and how it then was adapted for management of HIV and how it continues to be a part of the essential toolbox for responding to infectious disease outbreaks and overall disease control for the country. So um, I, I just wanted to share that because I think that there are human rights challenges that have impacted the response, um, but those lessons that um, you know Haiti has has learned over you know certainly within the most recent decade, but even stretching back before then, I think have have been really critical um, for the country's ability to respond to the current pandemic. I'm so glad that you've taken us in this direction because even the way I framed that question. Uh, you know, as if there, to, when we talk about countries outside the United States, we talk about human rights challenges, as if we shouldn't use that ex same exact language when we talk about what's happening inside the United States or in other countries right now as well. It seemed in your comments, you were, you, you said that there was some perception that things would be much worse in Haiti, in part because maybe people outside the country haven't educated themselves about uh, the capacity of the country or the kind of steps that have been taken. Can you say a little bit more about that? Where do those perceptions come from? Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of those perceptions are informed by just how devastating COVID has been across the globe, um, even in, in, in countries that have, you know, pr previously been heralded as, as having really strong public health systems and, and having the resources in place to be able to respond. And so I, I, I do think that was a large driver of the concern about what the impact um, would be uh, in Haiti. But I also think that um, the, the very real capacity gaps that exist in Haiti um, also inform those perceptions. But again, they're balanced mm -hmm. by the experience of local um, health professionals, of local leaders, of civil society groups, um, that, you know, unfortunately, because of, of disease outbreaks like cholera and other, have built up an expertise in being able to respond to these sort of outbreaks. And I, Maybe I want to come wanna, back to you. And, yeah, go ahead. Please, go ahead. I just wanted to agree with that. That's a really important point that, that the expectations were far worse and that, in fact, um, daily new cases peaked in Haiti back in June with about um, 5,000 active cases, and now they're down to 3,000 active cases. So they've bent the curve, right? The curve is going down, although there's still um, deaths occurring. Um, and so the 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 crisis of the that um, Francesco was referring to around political legitimacy is what actually makes the situation in the United States kind of similar. To Haiti, right? That we have this politicization and these rumors and, and false information and all of that. And it looked like Haiti was kind of getting into that kind of situation as well. And yet they've held together and they've overcome it in a way that the United States has not. And I think that's a, an important lesson. And again, speaks to this, I think, the strength of um, communities and organizations, community-based organizations in Haiti. Um, and this experience with, I mean, of course, the cholera epidemic, which you began with um, reading Edwige Danticat's comments on that, was, in, was introduced by the United Nations, who were supposed to be there helping, um, peacekeeping, and they caused um, a million people were infected, 10,000 died, mm -hmm. and yet Haiti overcame that. But what was interesting is the United Nations refused to take responsibility, and they never um, adequately compensated the country, um, despite demands that they acknowledge. Um, again, accountability. Where's the accountability? And in terms of like the response to the pandemic or to hurricanes and other disasters in the Caribbean, there's a long-standing demand from Caribbean governments for reparations, including both slavery reparations, but also climate reparations, and also 
questions mm -hmm. of debt cancellation and kind of who's responsible for, for this, who caused it and who should be paying for it. Mimi, I just want to stay with that for a minute because, yeah, no, go ahead. No, you, I should let you both talk. Go ahead, Francisca. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Scott. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I just felt like Mimi made such a, a, an important point, and I was just going to ask if I may add. Um, I think on that point, particularly on cholera and the fact that those who were most effective um, have yet to receive, um, you know, effective remedy or reparations. Um, for the harms caused by the introduction of, of cholera also kind of put so many households on their back foot because they were never really made whole from that initial um, uh, outbreak of cholera and the devastating impact that it, that it, it, it had and the, the risk that, you know, there was a recent report in, published in The Lancet you know, that, that commented that cholera cases may be at zero currently, but there is a very real public health risk um, that remains. And, and so I think it is um, absolutely important to continue to come back to these issues and questions about accountability and where responsibility lies and how um, actions are taken to acknowledge and accept that responsibility. And, you know, in the case of cholera, it really is a question of accepting legal responsibility as well. The question I was going to ask is is related to what both of you have just been talking about. And again, it's, it's to me, it's this concern I have about about the way the international aid disaster disaster risk production world works. works. And the and the, and what I worry about is sometimes this sort of vulnerability discourse in which part of the world is vulnerable and part of the world is invulnerable. And so um, lessons have to always be learned in through that prism somehow and i think in some ways for me you know as a person who born and educated in the united states and never heard about the haitian revolution until i was an adult i do feel like there are enormous blind spots in this hemisphere to important aspects of caribbean history but also the caribbean present that somehow don't come across and i i, I guess i wonder if either of you want to say a little bit more about those perceptions, because the perception becomes policy, it seems like, in so many cases. I mean, Mimi, you were talking even about this idea that it was somehow acceptable for the Department of Homeland Security to act and to block medical aid or to um, send active COVID sufferers back to Haiti rather than give them their uh, day in court in an immigration court. I can't help but think that these longstanding perceptions of vulnerability are connected also to these actions, but I'd like to hear from you on that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of historical, great historical research on um, what J. Michael Dash called, first called Haiti's bad press. And it began with the Haitian Revolution because they overthrew the system of slavery and colonial power. They liberated their country. And ever since that time, they've been hounded by France, British American kind of commentary on Haiti, which has been negative, 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 and trying to always undermine it, as well as then debt that was imposed um, and the, the indemnity that had to be paid to France, and then an ongoing debt that had to be paid to the United States. Um, and, you know, the, Haiti's been subjected to this for ever since the revolution. So, I mean, I think that is part of the context of understanding why we don't learn that history, why we learn it in a very distorted way, why there's always negative narratives about Haiti. And another um, anthropologist, Gina Ulissi, has written about the need for new narratives of Haiti and how important it is for us to tell mm -hmm. better stories. Um, and, you know, writers like Danticat have been part of helping to tell those more positive stories. But that's crucial, and um, it, it matters that we know that history and that we learn a more comprehensive version of it, and that we also understand the limitations of the United States as a, um, a power to do good. Because in Central America and the Caribbean and Latin America, the United States has done a lot of bad things and caused a lot of harm, and we have never really um, made repair of that harm either. 
Francisca, just to give you a moment, if there was anything in there you wanted to comment or respond. I mean, I think that Mimi summarized it so strongly um, because absolutely, I think the narrative around um, Haiti's role in the international system goes all the way back to, to the War of Independence and the um, challenge that Haiti's independence directly posed to the international system at the time and, and what it meant in terms of the country being effectively sidelined um, within the global community, whether it was the indemnity that you know France levied on Haiti, whether it was with the U.S. occupation that started in 1915. Um, and lasted for decades throughout Haiti, and the the impacts that that has had on Haiti's own governance structures, on its ability to invest in strong institutions and conferring essential services to its population, and really having a strong space for self-determination as a country within the international system. And so I, I think that as we kind of um, are facing um, this reckoning, honestly, um, here in the U.S. right now um, with the dual pandemics, um, you know, of COVID and, and also this, you know, addressing structural racism, um, mm. Haiti is a, plays it has a really important part to play in that narrative, um, in in understanding what the the devastating effects of structural racism, you know, can be, particularly for an entire nation and population and how do we shift that narrative how do we acknowledge the challenges those that are very real that haiti does face in, in its current moment while also acknowledging the strengths that haiti brings um, through its history and the the capacities that exist within the the local system um, and that brings me back again to you know it's very early and there's going to need to be more research to understand how COVID right. has played out in this way in haiti but I, I think that um, it, there are uh, strengths and technical capacities that Haiti has that's unique to its, its experience in dealing with out other outbreaks and infectious disease. Um, and you know, hopefully those are contributing factors to how we're seeing COVID um, kind of uh, playing out in the country right now. I want to remind people you're listening to COVID Calls, a really lively conversation today about Haiti and COVID-19 with Mimi Scheller and Francisca Lucien. And just, um, we're, we have a few minutes left. If you want to get questions in, please do put them in the YouTube live chat or you can put them up. We have a lively sort of side discussion going on Twitter right now. You feel free to get a question in, just tag at US of Disaster. We are, I don't know if it's fair to even say we're in the middle of things yet, but let's give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and say we are in the middle of this pandemic rather than still in the first act. And I wanna tie it back, Francisca, to your point that maybe Haiti ha was able to respond very aggressively and effectively in this first part of the pandemic, but the reality is that economic stress, some of which is tied back to the structural racism you were just talking about, um, that economic stress is coming due. And it, it, maybe you mentioned this as well, the strong pressures to reopen the country, particularly around the tourism industry, um, raise deeper questions about the sustainability of the tourism industry, I think, in the Caribbean more generally, environmentally, and, and from so many different perspectives. But I guess I'd like to get a little bit of your sense, both of you, on this, Francisca, first, in terms of what you see going forward from here. Can the country maintain such a successful response to COVID-19 um, with, without reopening? What happens with the reopening of tourism? Take us into that conversation. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that, um, I, I would agree that we're kind of in the middle of it right now. And so it is a bit hard to say. The concern is, is what we've seen as countries around the world start to reopen um, following COVID. I, I think that there have, um, been some successful examples um, so far, but even in countries that have taken a very, you know, public health centered, um, pragmatic approach, we're still seeing cases come up, new cases of COVID come up. Um, and then certainly what we're seeing here in the U.S. with states as they reopen, that the, a number of states face a, a research um, in COVID cases. And so I, I think it is going to be a concern for Haiti and the broader Caribbean as it starts to reopen um, and acknowledging that tourism is such an essential uh, industry 
for Caribbean nations. Um, I, I will say that on the Haiti side, I, I think, you know, there's the impact of COVID on tourism um, that's anticipated, but the tourism industry was already pretty hard hit um, by the, the um, kind of broader socio-political challenges that Haiti has been facing with, you know, the fuel shortages, the closing of um, hotels last year, um, the fact that, you know, airlines had stopped traveling to Haiti for a certain period of time during the, the gridlock um, in the end of, of 2019 um, and, and surging, you know, travel prices to get to Haiti. So I think it's a long road ahead on the tourism front and it's going to, to be one where I, I think, you know, it's going to take time because, because of the nature of what we're seeing with COVID around the world. And I'll, I'll just add there that, I mean, I think um, Haiti in a way benefits um, from the, the weakness of tourism at the moment, because tourism, uh, so many Caribbean countries that are so reliant on tourism, you know, it makes up um, $59 billion of the region's GDP, and it's 50 to 90% of GDP for many countries. Um, and as of August 3rd, 22 islands had reopened to tourism from the United States, where we know COVID is surging. So they're gonna be facing a real problem with tourists. But what some Caribbean leaders are calling for is that this is a chance to renegotiate the terms of tourism. And that could benefit Haiti as well, which is that there's a call for um, renegotiating the relationship with the cruise industry, for improving local food production and tying it into food sovereignty and food security across the region and kind of taking control of the downside of over tourism in some countries and sort of trying to develop more sustainable tourism and what some call village based tourism, um, agro tourism, et cetera. So that is something that Haiti could take part in helping to build those new um, more fair and just relations um, of travel and mobility between the U.S. and the region and within and around the region. I want to um, just acknowledge we're almost up on time and a, and a question for each of you, um, because we will move out of this period of time eventually. And you both introduced us to the idea that the normal uh, time vessel that we use for disaster in Haiti is not really adequate. You know, to think of a disaster as some immediate thing that then is easily resolved, is, it doesn't really capture the complexity of the history there. By the same token, I, I do like to think about recovery and what possibilities are raised. Maybe you were just, you were just pointing to some just there. And I guess I want to stay with that with you as sort of a final word here. What is an equitable recovery for Haiti or for the broader Caribbean look like to you? What what would be on your, if you had to prioritize some things that you thought were possible um, coming out of this period of time, what, what would those be? Yeah, well, I think the region as a whole is pushing towards more uh, sustainable ecological relations and that that could be achievable if we were to pay slavery reparations to the British West Indies, the French West Indies, climate reparations to the countries that have been harmed by climate change, and to then assist in building renewable energy projects, decentralized grids, water collection systems, preservation of ecosystems, the restoration of coral reefs, of mangroves, um, the limitation of tourism, and Basically, there's a vision for much healthier, sustainable human and natural systems within the region. And I think if it's going to sort of survive um, what, what I describe as the Anthropocene in, in my book, Island Futures, that we need to help support those kinds of projects and make sure that they happen. Are you in, and just give the full title again, Island Futures, Caribbean Survival and the Anthropocene, is coming out this fall with Duke Press, you you get into this these kinds of visions in the book, yes? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just in Haiti, it's, you know, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, um, the Bahamas after Hurricane Dorian, um, you know, Puerto Rico is still suffering from Hurricanes Irma and Maria um, and ongoing power 
blackouts and, and the migration of people away from the island. So, you know, there's many challenges ahead, but the solutions to them, I think, are shared across the region. Okay, I hope people will write that down because it will be really important to read that and see those visions articulated in, in one place. Uh, Francisca, mm -hmm. uh, final question to you, same question. From your vantage point, what does a, a just and equitable recovery from COVID-19 look like for Haiti? Yeah, I would say that it for Haiti and, and hopefully for for other for the global system as a whole is, is really looking at what a fair global economy um, looks like. And, and I think uh, recognizing the importance of public investment in sectors like health um, and other social sectors, including education and water and sanitation that would allow countries to have the resources in place um, in terms of you know, supplies and tools, but the essential staff as well um, to lead effective responses um, and to have services available to the population to, for whether it's for testing, whether it's you know, ICU beds, which has been a, a key issue for the response um, to COVID, whether it's ventilators, or you know, just the, the the package of services at all levels, um, you know, primary all the way through through critical care. Um, those really rely on on strong investment of, of um, through the national system to ensure that populations have access to those basic rights. Um, and so I, I think uh, you know, looking ahead in terms of an equitable response to COVID, um, that's really the hope that this can be a moment for. Um, you know, Haiti and other countries to to really relook at how how are decisions around investment um, and fiscal policy made um, within countries that uphold and and ensure the conferral of essential rights to their population across the board. Can I add one more comment there, Please. just to follow up to say I think it's also we haven't touched on it so much, but it's so important also to center gender equity and that the decision making that happens often excludes women and there after the earthquake there was a gen gender sh um, shadow report on sort of recovery and the importance of um, protection of sexual minorities and children and the incidence of rape that's happening um, both within the sort of population but also brought in by military and by aid workers like oxfam and those kinds of issues shouldn't be dropped in the sort of emergency of disaster recovery. They're central to it. And in Haiti, they say women are poto mitan, that is they're like the central pillar of the economy of society. And I think all disaster recovery reconstruction efforts need to sort of center women more than they do now. Strong visions for the future and what you both laid out seem to be uh, the mirror that Americans need to hold up to Haiti and, and take a look in our own country and see what lessons can be learned here. Um, I really appreciate this conversation and I, I want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls. Tomorrow we're going to revisit a theme we've discussed several times um, and with a new group of experts uh, tomorrow to talk about environmental justice, Cancer Alley, Louisiana. So we're getting an update on what COVID-19 is looking like there in Southern Louisiana. And we'll be talking about that from an environmental racism and environmental justice perspective. I also want to make sure I give a special shout out to Kathy Bergen, who has been a guest on COVID calls and she made the connection with Francisca Lucien. So I really appreciate her doing that. And Francisca, I appreciate your work and your time today. And Mimi Scheller, um, uh, always enjoy speaking with you. Thank you both so much for your, your wisdom today. Thank you. Thank you. It's really Scott. wonderful nice to be here. today with you and Mimi. Thank you again. You can catch COVID calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Stay healthy, everyone, and we will see you tomorrow.